Hey everybody, Leah Clay here with the Christian Post, and I'm so honored today to be joined by Priscilla Shire. She is the head of Going Beyond Ministries. She's a best-selling author and she's an actress. Her latest film is called The Forge. Well, Priscilla, I always love when I get to talk to you. You're always doing something just incredibly meaningful, and I feel like that just defines your ministry. And The Forge is such an incredible movie, such an incredible story. You've worked with the Kendrick brothers before. This is your latest project with them. So share why you wanted to be involved in this movie. Well, part of the reason is because of the admiration that my family and I have for the Kendrick brothers. Um, they just have such integrity. And what I know when they present a project to me is that it is really going to honor God, that that's going to be the basis of it. They're not going to sugarcoat Jesus. They're not going to try to water down or make more palatable by making less plain the message of scripture or the gospel or whatever the theme is. So that's the main thing that their integrity um, to that purpose really does draw me and connect my heart to them. Um, so, and I also know that the film is going to be entertaining. I know that it's going to have technical excellence that really does make the film watchable for audience so that they're endeared to it and then can lean in and hear what the message of the storyline is. So that's the main reason we're just so blessed by their integrity. Well, and you play Cynthia and you really embody Cynthia. I'm like, she is a mom. I can tell. And you have three sons. I do. How I do. has that experience informed the approach you took to Cynthia? Well, it's very interesting you asked me that because when they called me and they said, hey, we want you to play the mother of the main character who will be like a 20-year-old, a 19, 20-year-old young man. My first thought was, y'all's casting is so off because nobody's going to believe that I, I'm old enough to be the mother <laughs> of a 20-year-old. And then as soon as I said that, my next thought was, oh, wait a minute. I actually do have a 20-year-old in real life. So I probably do look like that. So for a moment there, it was kind of like the shocking realization that I actually am the mother of, of several grownups. I've got a 21-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 15-year-old, all young men. So I was really drawn and endeared to the idea of this woman who has poured her life into these kids and, and in, in the movie, into this one son. And she's a single mother, so she's had to do it alone after experiencing a lot of heartbreak and disappointment from a father who hasn't shown up. And um, so in my own experience, it's been the opposite, that my husband is a great dad, and I recognize the value of that. I recognize the, the um, importance of that sort of an influence on all children's lives, but again, with the storyline here, a young man's life. Um, so this mother, her heart is burdened, and she's hopeful and prayerful that other young men will fill in the, or other older men will fill in the gap for her young man. And as that happens, and you see her just thrilled that there are surrogate dads. Um, I could totally feel that. Um, so I was grateful to be able to just kind of step in and play a role that is quite similar to the one that I'm dealing with in my, my own life right now. Well, and your husband and your son have a cameo appearance in the movie. <laughs> what was that like? See, I mean, that must have just been so incredibly powerful seeing your husband and son in this movie about generational, you know, spirituality and discipleship. Yeah, really cool that the Kendrick brothers kind of stuck them in, mostly because if anybody who knows my husband knows, he is not trying to be on camera. He's not trying to be in front or anything. So for them to be able to convince him to do it was a huge feat. But then him, like you mentioned, him and our youngest son, Jude, being able to be in this film together and the scenes they are in are about mentorship. They're where you see a room full of older men and younger men who are connected together in discipleship seeing that with my husband and my son in those scenes was incredibly moving while they were filming it. And as I've watched it back now, I've just been like, Lord, thank you that you've allowed us to be a part of this, this um, project together as a family. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that really stuck out to me watching this movie was how countercultural it is. This idea of male leadership man is the head of the household, that we need male mentorship is not popular right now at all. So this movie is very countercultural in that way. Why is this message so important? Why is it important that the church stands up and says, hey, no, this is how God created the family. Male leadership is an absolute necessity in the home. Uh, yeah, um, it is important. And it is the design that the Lord had in mind when he created family. Obviously, we live in a broken world. And so there are so many 
um, parents who are doing it by themselves. So many women like Cynthia in the film who are doing it by themselves and are doing an amazing job. But this is where the body of Christ comes in, where there are surrogate parents and surrogate aunties and uncles and people that fill in the gaps in all of our children's lives. And so seeing males step up to the plate of influence and leadership in these young people's lives in this film, I really do think is going to inspire and encourage the body of Christ to rise up and fill in those gaps that they see around them with the people that are they're doing church with every week. And it maybe is never occurring to them that that single mother or that a single father raising his children, that he could use um, the partnership of some women in the church that come around to his daughters and help to cultivate them and, and um, teach them the principles of scripture in regards to womanhood. So it's true on both sides. And we can be um, a surrogate family to one another as we walk through um, these seasons of life. Yes, yeah, studies show that intergenerational relationships are key to keeping young people in the church. I was talking to a pastor who said, you know, you don't, you leave an organization, but you don't leave a family. So yeah. what challenge do you want church members, older church members to take away from this movie when they look at the next generation instead of just hand wringing and say, well, young people are walking away from the church. Why do we need to be developing these relationships, going out and seeking these? Yeah, like you just mentioned, when people feel connected relationally to any sort of organization, so even if you set the church aside, uh, young people, those that are coming up in their teenage years and their 20s and onward through their 30s, other organizations in which they're involved, the reason they stay planted in those organizations or those ministries or those groups is because they feel a connection to the other people that they are there, folks who are walking through life with them. So couples with young children, they will find themselves drawn to organizations or opportunities to be with other couples that have young children because they're doing their play dates together and taking some vacations together and inviting each other over for dinner so the kids can play. I remember that season of life. You're connected with people in different pockets of life and that's what keeps you connected to an overall mission. Well, the same is true for the church, that if there's not, like you said, intergenerational connection, but also peer-to-peer -peer connection when we're walking with each other, not just once a week on a Sunday or a Wednesday night at a Bible study, but on the regular Mondays and Tuesdays, that there's relationship, that there's somebody calling and saying, how you're doing? Or, hey, let me drop off a meal, or I made extra, y'all come over and let's hang out tonight. So that husbands and husbands are connecting, wives and wives are connecting, kids of like mind are connecting, and they're realizing, my parents aren't the only ones that think like this and are guiding our family like this. They have to know and feel and understand that there are other people of like mind, like interests that are walking together. And that's what keeps them connected to the overall mission. And I will say the encouragement of the older generation to the younger generation, when I look back on my life, had it not been for people that were 10 years older than me in marriage or ministry or motherhood, that were encouraging me along, saying to me, I've already been there and done that. Raising the toddlers are, is hard or raising the teenagers is hard. But let me tell you, you can make it through. Let me also tell you how. Let me give you some wisdom and insight, but also some encouragement. Seeing someone from the next generation who can encourage you because they've already been there and done that, that right there is priceless in keeping your mind fixed on the journey ahead. Mm. When I look at your family and it's so beautiful to see your father and his four children and then your children, just everybody involved in the church, involved in ministry as a mother of four sons, what advice do you have for parents to raise godly children who know and who love the Lord in a culture that doesn't support us in that venture? You know, the best thing I can say, and I see this in my parents example and value it much more now that I'm older and have a little bit more clarity on what it, how difficult it is to parent children. The word that comes to my mind is consistency. Perfection is not the goal because none of us are going to be a perfect parent. There are things we are going to look back on in hindsight and wish we would have done differently because we're just doing the best we can with what we know in the moment. Um, but my parents, what they taught me was that consistency matters. Just keep showing up. Decide what you want the priorities to be for your family, whether that's, you know, we try to sit down at the dinner table and have dinner together as a family as often as possible as we can throughout the week, or, you know what, we're going to have a devotional together as a family, or this is the block of time, maybe from two to four o'clock that nobody's on their phones and we just have a little quiet in the house and everybody does something else with their time other than be on their phone, whatever sort of uh, details like that, that you want to set for your family. 
you won't do them perfectly, but do them consistently. And I realize now in hindsight that my mom continuing to cook, cook a meal so that she could invite the kids and dad to the table and we could all sit down together. That's hard when you've got ungrateful kids who don't like the chicken, the way you made the chicken today, and they got an attitude because they'd rather be doing other things. I realize now that wasn't happening by accident. That was happening because my mom kept showing up even when she was discouraged and tired and frustrated, but that now has built habits into the culture of our family that continue now. And my mom has gone on to be with the Lord. So that sort of integrity throughout the fabric of your, your, the culture of your family, again, perfection will wear you out, exhaust you, and you'll constantly be disappointed because life is not going to allow perfection, but consistency, choose the things that are important and then keep showing up and doing them. And God will honor that. I love that advice. Now you have a new book coming out called I Surrender All, which is about surrendering to Jesus fully. What can you tell us about this book? Yeah, it really is the message of the film, The Forge. The idea of it is really what does discipleship look like? So it's a call to people really who are already believers. We've already placed faith in Jesus Christ, but while salvation is free, discipleship costs because this means that I want more than just a ticket to heaven. And we're so grateful that salvation offers us that. But discipleship is, I want to actually experience heaven while I'm on earth. I want the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I want the power of the Holy Spirit resting on my life. Well, that means that you are surrendering your the entirety of your life to him. And it asks the question, the book asks the question, what parts of your life and mine Am I holding back and reserving and keeping from his full, from full disclosure to him? He knows anyway, but am I holding on to entertainment choices? Not that are necessarily wrong. They've just taken first place. Anything that has taken more of a priority that I love more, that I worship more, that I'm holding on really tightly. And you always know what those things are when he's asking us to release them to walk away, to let go of that relationship, to go into a new season and let this one go. The fear that keeps us from doing that, the, the tight, tightly closed fist, the selfishness that keeps us from being able to let go, that points an arrow to really what are the idols in our life that we value and prioritize more than him. So I Surrender All and The Forge are ba both basically about that, that I'm a believer, but how do I surrender everything so that I can um, really experience the fullness of what discipleship and the abundant life actually require and what it means? Yeah, absolutely. Our prayer is the fundamental thing in the life of a Christian. It's not just a spare tire that right. you know, we pull out when we need to. What do you yeah. viewers, especially in the church, take away from the forge, take away from your book when it comes to the importance of prayer and the role it should play in our lives? Yeah, that prayer actually is the key that God has given his children to be able to unlock the resources of heaven and have them unleashed onto the landscape of our earth. Um, why wouldn't we use a key like that? Mm -hmm. um, we are so quick to set it aside, either when times are good and steady because we don't feel compelled because everything's okay, or when things are in the dumps and we're really discouraged and overwhelmed. Sometimes we set it around then because we're too busy, we're, we're so concerned and overly focused on the issues. And these are the two seasons of life where instead of setting it aside, we should be most prioritizing it, most pressing into our relationship with God so that we experience his presence and his peace and his power. And the key, prayer is the key that lets us access all of that. Prayer doesn't manipulate God. Prayer just accesses what he wants to do for us and who he wants to be for us in the regular rhythms of our everyday living anyway. And so I'm I'm praying that through these resources, it will remind the church, all of us within the body of Christ, of the privilege that prayer actually is, that the God of the universe would actually let us talk to him, and then he would want to communicate back with us through the Holy Spirit. That's a privilege that we shouldn't take for granted, shouldn't push to the second-rate priorities of our life, but should make an ongoing part of the regular rhythms of every day. Wonderful. Priscilla, thank you so much, as always. Thank you. It's so good to see you.